All right, hello. I think I'm supposed to use this. All right, um, hello and welcome. I'm Audrey Kurth Cronin. I'm the director of the Carnegie Mellon Institute for Strategy and Technology. And I'm very glad to see you all here. Thanks for coming. Come on in. There are seats over on this side. So before we get into the business of the day, uh, I want to announce some wonderful news that we have from Carnegie Mellon Institute for Strategy and Technology. And it only came out in the last uh, 20 minutes, Emily. Is that about right? So absolutely fresh off the presses, particularly of interest to the students, but also the faculty, is confirmation that we now have a new undergraduate degree, the major, the BS in Political Science, Security, and Technology, a new minor in Political Science, Security, and Technology, and a new minor in American Politics and Law. So we are super excited about that, and uh, I hope you are too, because I think the curriculum is going to be of great interest to you now that we're finally able to share it. I mean, it's been driving us crazy the last few months. Um, and we have other things in the works that I'm not allowed to tell you about, so um, hang in there. All right, uh, today we are here to um, begin our brand new speaker series, which is called Scientists and Strategists. And uh, the Carnegie Mellon Institute for Strategy and Technology, or what we call CMIST, is very proud to be launching this new uh, series, which is all about trying to tie the wonderful people that build our technologies together with the people who make decisions about deploying them. So um, today I'd like to introduce our first very distinguished speaker, who is Sarah Kreps, John L. Wetherill, president, uh, professor in the Department of Government and director of the Cornell Tech Policy Institute at Cornell University. Professor Kreps, uh, is, um, as I said before, the first speaker in the Scientists and Strategists series. And we're very excited about bringing together the brilliant scientists and engineers within this university with those of us who are studying the political and economic and social and ethical aspects of technology as they are deployed, particularly with national and international security applications. Professor Kreps is a former Air Force officer with an undergraduate degree in environmental science from Harvard University, a Master's of Science in Environmental Change and Management from Oxford University, and a PhD in Government from Georgetown University. She has non-residential appointments at a number of prominent policy institutions, including Brookings, the Bitcoin Policy Institute, and the Jane Family Institute. And she's also a life member of the prestigious Council on Foreign Relations. Professor Kreps is a prolific writer, being the author of four single-authored books and three co-edited or co-authored books, a remarkable pace of writing. All of those books are in the broad political science subfield of security studies. Come on in. Notable among those books are two on the use of large unmanned aerial vehicles in warfare, including one titled Drone Warfare, and another titled Drones, What Everyone Needs to Know, and those were both published by Oxford University Press. In 2018, Professor Kreps also wrote a book called Taxing Wars, The American Way of War Finance and the Decline of Democracy, also published with Oxford. Its central argument is that failing to tax and pay for the wars at the time that they happen means that those wars become never-ending and their costs are borne by future generations. Professor Kreps has also published dozens of peer-reviewed articles in areas as disparate as international security, medicine, which was a surprise to me, computer science, and conflict resolution. So you can see that she is the kind of problem-oriented, creative, and truly interdisciplinary thinker that we recognize and greatly appreciate here at Carnegie Mellon University. So today, Professor Kreps will be talking to us about her latest book manuscript, which has the tantalizing title. I wish I could come up with titles like this. It's phenomenal, Sarah. The title, 
Boomers, Doomers, and the Politics of Technology. Let's welcome Professor Sarah Kreps to the Carnegie Mellon Institute for Strategy and Technology and Carnegie Mellon University. Well, thank you for that warm introduction and for the invitation to be here today. Uh, so, yeah, a few things um, to note maybe. One is that uh, my uh, dad grew up in Pittsburgh and my parents met on Craig Street. So I feel like it all came, it all started here and so it's all coming full circle. And in a way, the book is kind of a full circle. I was going to say, see, I can't get away with this with a tech audience. I was going to say a full circle arc. But you would all know that an arc is, an, is, an, is not a full circle. So uh, two arcs together of my last many decades of thinking about technology, practicing technology, being asked by the media about technology. Uh, and so by way of a bit more of an introduction, uh, as uh, you heard, I was in the military. Um, and actually, I, I was, for those of you who are in the audience and you think, well, I like this and I also like that, but it might be too circ circuitous. Um, I've had a very circuitous journey to get here. So I was pre-med as an undergrad. I worked in hospitals. That's why I, you know, I was one of these people that I was like a candy striper and volunteering in the downtown hospital. And then I realized I just did not like blood. And so I just thought that I, I could be a radiologist or I could do something that didn't involve medicine. And so I have, so, so I kind of took a, a bit of a different route, and part of that was influenced by being in the military, where I worked on drones after 9-11. And I also remember, so I was ROTC in college, and I remember my first day showing up before freshman year even started for our orientation in Air Force ROTC, which we did with MIT. And all these MIT guys showed up, and they're like, we can't wait to blow shit up. And I'm like, that's not why I'm here. I'm not planning on blowing anything up. Um, but it was really interesting because it was the mindset of an engineer, not all engineers, but just kind of thinking like, what is possible? And I just, and, and I didn't approach things from the like, the world is my oyster and I shouldn't know any limits. And so that all kind of was percolating in thinking about then my role in developing drones that we then deployed after 9-11 and kind of thinking about some of these ethical questions. And as I'll um, quote Steve Jobs, this question of the, that the questions that are often not asked are the ones that are the most important. And, and so thinking about, so those are my boomers in this story, this idea of like the insatiable curiosity that I love about technology. And I think is so important for our economy and for society. And, that tension between the, the boomers who know no limits um, and the doomers who think in, that everything is a risk and that we should have a zero risk technology. And so I, I, I position myself somewhere in the middle of that and suggesting in this argument that, that, that you need the boomers because you need innovation, you need to know what's possible. But in some ways without the doomers we could end up going down the road of blowing everything up. And so that pendulum swings and that equilibrium puts us somewhere in an innovation space, but with guardrails. And so that's kind of where the argument goes. Um, so, I, it, it, so I'm on sabbatical this year. And so I've had a lot of headspace to kind of think about this and do some writing, a lot of writing. Um, so I had the fall to kick it into gear so I have written a draft of this book manuscript, but it is a really good time to get feedback on the argument, feedback on the evidence. So I really look forward to hearing from you. So we've all heard about generative AI and, uh, and probably used it a lot. And I think it's great. And I've wor I, worked, I was one of the early academic collaborators of OpenAI back in 2018. So I started working with them to understand the political consequences of this technology. And what was interesting is no one cared. No one outside this little niche of you know, machine learning and LLMs was paying attention to this. And suddenly, a year ago, they come up with a consumer-facing version of what some of us had been working on for years. And it 
just soared to the fastest growing app to reach 100 million active users. So just two months after its launch. And what followed from that was what, you know, kind of in the public discourse was a very familiar pattern. This idea that, oh my gosh, we have this technology and it's going to lead to our demise. And, and, and it seemed very catastrophic, which, you know, without even kind of knowing what the, you know, the sort of paperclip scenarios seemed unlikely from generative AI, but those were trotted out. Uh, and so what happened then a year later was this kind of implosion of open AI. So this pioneer in generative AI, and suddenly you have a very public uh, uh, civil war between what was cast, and this is, where the t the, this is where the title of the book came from, between the so-called boomers, these, um, you know, the uh, Sam Altman and Greg Brockman, who were saying that they wanted AGI as quickly as possible, and the doomers who were then on record writing academic articles that Helen Toner thought no one was reading, which they weren't until they were. And those articles were questioning whether moving toward AGI, whether we were going too quickly. And so this was pitted as a war between the doomers and the boomers. And so, you know, again, kind of, I, I think a lot about these debates when I'm asked by the by journalists and the media about you know are we moving too quickly and so I started thinking about this debate as it was playing out but just in general which is well what does it mean to move too quickly what are the right guardrails how do we know and so around this time there was then also this 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 uh, frenzy about uh, where Congress was in all of this. And so this was again kind of this question in my mind, you know, where is, who will write the rules for AI? The, you know, this almost arms race of who can regulate it first. Um, and the question again that I kept asking is, as recently as last week, is Congress quote behind in AI regulation? And I asked this journalist five times, I said, what do you mean be, she didn't like this question. I said, so behind compared to what? So how do we first need to articulate the, the harms and know what those harms are, and then we can start to think about whether we're behind or ahead. And so as I think about these questions, I, I've come around to uh, a few, you know, I've danced around a few questions. Right now it's kind of this central question of how do we end up in this pattern, which is, and I'll, I'll talk about this because I have cases, I look from, nuclear weapons to social media, AI, commercial space like SpaceX, um, and cryptocurrency. And what you see is this very common pattern of the technology emerges, it scales, it becomes disruptive, there's the oh my gosh, it's the wild west of X. Um, and what I also find interesting about this is that often it's the case where it's not just the policymaker that expresses dismay, but often the innovator, him or herself. Um, and so this actually came up in a, a conversation with someone I was meeting with earlier, um, Jeff, I'm not sure he, if he's here, but he was talking about um, the case of the individual, I wrote this down because I thought it was, <laughs> quite on point. The individual who um, developed the, oh no, it was Vince, I think, the endless, the endless scroll. And he develops this thing and it's kind of like, let me come up with this algorithm that will make it easier to scroll. And then he concludes that this is this do dopamine fix has actually gotten people into a lot of kind of pathologies of endless time online too, which is not where he saw this going. And so it's this question both of the policymaker and the innovators, how do we end up, how, how do they not think down the game tree um, over and over? And so the argument is, uh, it's almost like a three-part play. So we have this development, the tech boomers are innovating, they're earnestly seeking truth and science and formulas and math, and this is all 
um, in, in their view, in some ways, kind of a disciplinary tunnel vision. Again, sounds to me that Carnegie Mellon is very interdisciplinary. So maybe that's not the case here. But I think in general, when I look at historical cases, um, you know, I, I, and I talk about this in the book manuscript, Alfred Nobel, and he's this chemist and he's developing, he's developing explosives. And he thinks that he, he was from a chemistry family. He's following in the footsteps of his dad. And then he's like, oh my gosh, I invented this thing that can allow countries to blow each other up. That's just not what I thought I was doing. So I'm going to create the Nobel Peace Prize to kind of atone for my sins here. So why do those things happen? So I have an argument about the, the tech boomers. I have then the second part, which is the, the Wild West part, the, 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 the success and scale, which is what innovators go for, which is scale. You want to scale, scale, scale is that success then leads to disruption that was unanticipated. Um, but then it resolves uh, because that success leads to kind of these boomers becoming victims of their success. So they kick in feedback me mechanisms. And the argument is that if you're looking only to Congress, you might not see those mechanisms kicking in. But those mechanisms are taking place through the public, pu public pushback, um, uh, the media, uh, employees themselves. So there are a lot of different cases of this. You know, for example, early on with um, Google and Project Maven in 2018. And the Google employees, you know, Google's involved in this DOD project. And uh, the employees and this, this uh, project was intended to use uh, Google's savvy in machine learning to essentially process terabytes of drone footage and figure out and help the military discern what is a, a combatant versus a civilian. And the, 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 the Google employees say, that's not why we came to work for Google. And so they 3,000 of the engineers signed a letter, um, pushed back, and Google then ended its contract. Uh, so those are the kinds of feedback mechanisms that I'm talking about here. And so where that ends up is that Despite this catastrophizing rhetoric, we end up time after time short of those doomer prognostications. So what I'm looking at in my book, I've, I've been doing a lot of interviews. I'm part of the way through that data collection on the growth of tech and original survey evidence. Uh, so this is kind of the starting point. Um, and again, you know, one of the things that really seems recurrent here is these experiences I've had when I'm in a room with really curious uh, innovators. And this was the one here. So I work, um, I'm often at Cornell pulled in on NSF grants to do the social science part of it, where the, because I do a lot of behavioral work trying to understand how people will feel about technology. So I was working with. Um, my uh, engineers who work with mycelium and they just were it was great because they were so excited about all the things you could do with mycelium and I said well so has anyone studied what users would think about that no but wouldn't it be awesome and so those kinds of questions which are great but that, but again it's not always asking the right question so I was working with a startup um, and uh, at the, the bottom here is part, part of their website how um, Boston Medical Center uses AI to measure and enhance medical outcomes I don't know have you have they looked at how patients will feel about AI being used in their public or their their personal health um, humane which is is an, a recent case so this is the AI pin that is quote, the embodiment of our vision to integrate AI into the fabric of daily life. So you wear it. The idea actually is to, um, it's using tech to try to uh, remove tech, in the, tech dependence. But so you, I'm sure you've all seen this, but um, so you wear it as a lapel pin and this was trotted out at like Milan Fashion Week. Um, they're all, already laying people off because it turns out it, no one actually, seems to want that. Um, Google Glass, maybe some people have that. Again, like great ideas in principle, um, but often lacking the sense of like, what did users think? And that's actually something that in the Air Force, I remember this um, 
as you know, when you go to these these courses that they make you do, and you're at the time you're thinking, why am I here? But then, like years later, it still comes back to me, which is because I worked with engineers there, and and the question that we were told to continue to ask the engineers is, um, what do the users want? And it's easier to design that in from the inception than to try once the product is out to retrofit it. Um, this case here is one of my favorites. So Newton, uh, he's, he's just, I think, like the classic innovator, brilliant guy. But he's like, I wonder what would happen if I stick a pin in my eyeball. Maybe I'll understand how light reflects in the retina. And it's really good he did that, because now we don't have to. <laughs> um, but what, what, what this uh, experience, these experiences, again, st uh, so start to aggregate up to something that looks like a pattern. So in Greek mythology, Prometheus is a titan. He defies Zeus, the king of the gods. He steals fire from Mount Olympus. He gives it to humanity. This is a great act of rebellion. He gives the, the gift of knowledge and enlightenment to humanity but it also makes Zeus mad. And so Zeus then, um, Prometheus is bound to a rock and every day an eagle, which is the emblem of Zeus, eats Prometheus's liver, which regenerates overnight due to his immortality, re resulting in perpetual suffering. So interestingly then, this is what you get with Frankenstein, which is this um, character from you know, the 1800s literature same idea is the sort of tortured scientist creates something that he thinks is valuable, but it turns out that it leads to consequences he didn't envision. Um, and then again, the book, American Prometheus, riffing off the same idea of the tortured innovator, the tortured uh, re innovative rebel, uh, Robert Oppenheimer, who, uh, for those of you who either read the book or has studied him or watched the movie, knows that he was involved in the bomb project, as were all of his contemporaries, his scientific contemporaries, and then really after the fact was quite tortured himself about the consequences, the political consequences of what he had created. And so it can seem both puzzling and not, you know, to someone thinking about these questions, why then these innovators, why don't they just not do it in the first place? Like why, what gets them into this kind of scientific buyer's remorse? So I haven't yet counted the times that Mark Zuckerberg has apologized for missteps by the platform, but it's a lot. Um, and so the you know and and we know from Oppenheimer that um, this was something you know he talks after the the Trinity um, test. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. And what you start to see as you look at these innovators again, Alfred Nobel um, and so many others that they develop these technologies. Oh, and this is the um, that's the explosive there. Uh, is this scientific curiosity that then gets, it, it goes further than, the, it's, uh, than what these science, scientists seem to intend from the outside. Um, and, and, and my, but my take on that is an optimistic one. Um, and so what you start to see again is this pattern of like quirky, brilliant, but sometimes in the clouds and tunnel visioned thinkers. Um, and this is a bit cliche, the, the Edison quote, but I think it's really important because it speaks to just, you know, once you're at the 99% perspiration and you're sweating so much, you sometimes can stop thinking about what you're doing. You're just, you're in it, you're working hard. And I think that that's something I was reading all these biographies and autobiographies of the Manhattan Project scientists and including Richard Feynman's, who I'd really recommend because he's a really clever and smart uh, and good writer. Just you're, it's like you're in a lab with people and you're, think, you're just kind of the collegiality, you're working with your, your pals, and you're also just determined to be successful. So, so Sam Altman was asked, and this was before he went to OpenAI, um, he was at Y Combinator, which is a, you know, helps startups. 
And he was asked what it takes to be a successful innovator. And he said, being smart and having good ideas, is, are, that's a necessary but not sufficient condition. You need to just be so determined. Um, and you know, you've heard that so many times with Mark Zuckerberg, which is move quickly and break things, and how he would end every meeting with domination. And so it's idea that you have some good ideas, but like you're going to do it faster and better, and you're going to color outside the lines if that's what it takes. So that's a part of it, is kind of the mindset of someone who's, it's like a survivorship bias, is whoever's going to make it is, generally will have a lot of these characteristics. Um, a, second, a second component of this question of how do we end up, how do we end up with this scientific buyer's remorse? So a second part of this is the scientific curiosity. Um, so this is from the F Richard Feynman project. So he says, we started for a good reason, then you're working really hard to accomplish something. It's a pleasure, it's exciting. You stop thinking about what you're doing. Um, and Oppenheimer, who said about the hydrogen bomb, which he was pretty ambivalent about, he said, yes, but it was technically so sweet that you couldn't argue about that. So there's something scientifically rich about, um, about the curiosity of, of innovation. There's some really interesting, as, again, as you start to do the, some of the historical work on that, um, it becomes really interesting. Some of the really dumb things that scientists have, scientists have done along the way in the name of discovery. And this conundrum that we wouldn't know, for example, necessarily with nuclear weapons, what sort of thresholds exist without doing some of those tests that we look back and think were really risky and dumb. When you watch some of the videos and you see how close people were to some of these tests, um, you wonder, but you also then wonder, would we know, was it obvious at that time or did you only, could you only know by doing? Uh, so there's this uh, case of a Canadian physicist, Louis Slotin, and he was conducting this um, experiment that Richard Feynman calls tickling the dragon's tail. So he and seven scientists were testing levels of radiation that were attainable just before criticality. So he had the idea that he could regulate the reaction using both um, a screwdriver uh, to keep two hemispheres, the plutonium core, within a hemisphere of beryllium alloy um, and his instincts uh, apart so that since those, that, 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 if those two parts would immediately start a chain reaction if they came in contact. Um, unfortunately, the screwdriver slipped um, and those, and you should see the pictures. Well, you can see here how close he is to this. Um, and what is fascinating, again, from a kind of uh, clinical perspective here, is that then for the next nine days, they took meticulous notes of his radiation sickness until the ninth day when it was quite final and determinate that he had died. Uh, but it was all in the name of, of scientific discovery. Uh, so that's the second part. And then the third is just this, um, this perennial sense of the prisoner's dilemma. Um, and this idea that we may think that it, we the scientists might think that this particular innovation is, has ethical concerns or that it might uh, be a problem. But the belief that, well, if we don't do it, someone else will. And you see that as early as um, 1939. So this is the letter that Einstein had written to uh, President Roosevelt. And he talks about how the scientific community has been involved in these pursuits for years. And then at the end, he says, I understand that Germany has actually stopped the sale of uranium um, that is an indication that Germany is probably working on the bomb. So this, you know, if you could guarantee that your opponent isn't doing this thing, well, you might choose not to do it. But since you can't guarantee that they won't, you can't tie your hands either unilaterally. And so that dynamic recurs a lot over these innovations. Um, you've seen that very much with uh, with the with the AI, so even you know, and you see that interestingly in AI with both at the country level and the firm level. 
So at the country level, you have Putin saying, whoever rules AI rules the world. So he's really staking a pretty aggressive claim here. Um, and then uh, the Microsoft CEO says <laughs> a, a year ago, a race starts today, we're gonna move and move fast. And at that firm level, it's also pretty, it, it's a salient, especially as money gets dumped into this, VCs are involved, the stakes are really high. So it's difficult, even though all of these AI individuals and firms are saying, we wanna regulate AI, they also know uh, that if they don't get into this, someone else will. And interestingly, even with Elon Musk, who says as early as 2015, that we shouldn't do it, there, there, should, we, shouldn't, we should pull the plug on AI. Um, he said that as recently as last year, that there should be a six month moratorium. And then as, as soon as it was very clear that there was not going to be a moratorium, uh, he goes all in on AI. And so that dynamic of there's a real arms race and the stakes are high, if you don't do it, someone else will. So that's kind of the first part of the story, which is you have these um, visionaries, these well-intended boomer visionaries. They're coming up with these great ideas, sometimes not great ideas, uh, and they push them, they push them hard. So then what happens? Well, uh, we end up with the kind of unintended consequences. And this, I think, has also happened in a number of different contexts. So again, my cases that I've, that I've talked about and that I'm looking at, we see this obviously with, with nuclear weapons. Uh, and the, the post-mortem, if you will, after Trinity and after they, the weapons were used in 1945, what do we do now? Uh, um, the top chart is of exposure to state-sponsored accounts over time of survey respondents. So this is an article from Nature about, uh, you know, the, you can see primarily Russian affiliated um, content online. Um, and this is a case down in uh, Myanmar. So Facebook admits that it was used, that the platform was used to incite violence in Myanmar. So in all of these cases, this is not really what the innovators wanted or expected. So then this part of this stage is this Wild West catastrophizing. And, and here again, it's whereas I think there's no real playbook for the innovators, there clearly seems to be a playbook for the policymakers. It, every single time it's the, oh, we're, we're, we're in the Wild West phase of... Um, of this particular technology. Um, I was in actually a, a talk, this was from 2021, but he said it again um, at a um, SEC chair, Gary Gensler, in, at a talk I went to of his with um, in December, 2023, he again talks about the wild west of consumer protection with respect to crypto. So where does this leave us? And what is what, what I find interesting and I think is, is, um, is, is variable here is what then the scientists do. Um, so, you know, and how the, how the policymakers are responding. So what often happens is they get brought onto Capitol Hill. So uh, Mark Zuckerberg's first time on Capitol Hill was in two, April 2018. Um, which is interesting in a way because it shows the company was around since, or the platform had been around since 20, 2004. So it takes 14 years for Congress to take notice, which is fine. But I think what it speaks to is the, a very reactive kind of thing. Um, so we hear this a lot with crypto, no overarching um, framework. And some of this is not Congress's fault. A, they have a lot going on. B, there's a real governance challenge. Um, anyone know what this is from on the left? I feel like this audience might. It is, but, but it's from a particular white paper. So it's from the uh, 2008 uh, Satoshi white paper on Bitcoin. Um, and uh, it, you know, and it, so, so this is from the white paper, um, and uh, what, I, what I think is useful about it as an illustration 
is that these technologies almost by definition are difficult to understand because mo uh, I think something like seven members of Congress have a STEM degree. Um, there are two computer scientists. Uh, but also even the, the geniuses don't quite understand this. This is, this is from an uh, a, a, a article he wrote in 1946. Anyone who understands quantum theory is either lying or crazy. Not even the scientists completely understand atomic energy. Um, this is a representative in a quantum house hearing in 2018. I can understand 50% of the things you say to the, the, the expert witness. These are difficult. So, so you can see the asymmetry in expertise between the policymakers who are trying to figure out what to do and the scientists who came up with these technologies who themselves are still trying to figure it out. So that sets up a real governance challenge. And so against this backdrop, the question is, we're in the Wild West. You know, how, what's the appropriate response? And I think that's something that policymakers are really trying to figure out and don't always have good answers. So one of the premises of this, this argument um, is that there, there's a menu of different possibilities you could imagine. One is new laws. The problem with new laws is, uh, well, the, uh, quite a few things. One is, again, we established that the, the members of Congress don't always know or understand the technology. Um, but there are several other problems. One is that it's potentially really costly. Like, it's not costless to pass new laws. B, uh, nothing really easily gets done in Washington. Um, and try, so, so for example, on um, on internet or privacy reform, a lot of sort of both, part, both, both sides of the aisles might agree that Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act should be reformed, but they can't at all agree on how to do it. Um, another consideration is that the technology moves fast. Um, uh, Vince and I were talking about uh, being on committees in the spring, last spring, for generative AI, which I was at, at Cornell as well. We started the committee in January. At, in January, the, the committee, which was comprised of all the different departments uh, that might touch on AI in the university, they were talking about uh, forbidding the use of, of generative AI for all students, period, which I was a little leery of. But it was pretty clear by March that that was just not even a possibility, that you were not putting this thing back in the bottle. And so this is a challenge or indicative of the challenge that policymakers face, is that the technology moves so quickly. So how do you come up with a new law that's not going to just address today's technology, but as we found out, two months from then, generative AI looked so different. Um, and then there's a geopolitical angle to this, which is, as I cited, I uh, quoted Putin, saying that AI, whoever rules AI rules the world, uh, policymakers might have a disincentive to hamstring uh, this major source of the country's economy. So if you look, for example, at the top six company, American companies by market cap, they're all tech firms, every single one of them. Uh, so there is a way in which this can look, this can be very self-defeating. But, um, but, 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 but it's not an all of a, it's not a dismal story. It's not, it's, there's a lot of optimism, but even if you're a doomer, I think there are reasons to think that this might end well. And the reason is that there is, are these feedback mechanisms that get triggered. You just need to look in the right place. So, the, so I talk about these account, the accountability ecosystem that goes beyond new laws. So if you're looking for new laws, I think you will say that, um, that boomers have won. We're still relying on the 1976 Copyright Act. Uh, that's so many decades old. Like, how can that possibly be, rele be relevant? But I think there are a lot of other ways that account, uh, other forms that accountability takes. Um, so the public, the media, these companies themselves, uh, executive agencies, advertisers, employees and whistleblowers. And what happens in these cases is that they warn of the excesses and then act as the guardrails for new technologies. Uh, so I have a couple of different um, case studies that I've been looking at, um, and I don't want to spend a ton of time on these because they're just meant to illustrate 
Um, but one of the ones in the, one of the, 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 the nuclear weapons is one of the big, well, one of the five that I'm looking at in this book. Um, and in, in thinking about nuclear weapons, I think it's easy to look at just this, you know, the, the culmination of the bomb and, but taking a step back, it's really clear that this was a culmination of a much longer intellectual genealogy. And so scientists already in the 1890s were taking steps in this direction. And the point of this genealogy in my book is to show that these scientists were all part of an epistemic community. They were all working together. And they, it, it, what that created was a sense of scientific pursuit, but also a pretty clear calculation that if the uh, scientists at Los Alamos weren't doing it, the Germans probably were because these were people who had worked together in the years before the war. So then you get to this Wild West post-war window of real apocalypse, you know, the Trinity test. And there's so many tests that uh, that picture on the left is the Trinity test, but it looks a lot like these tests they did in the army where they would put these poor, you know, privates, you know, 10 feet away from the bomb and then detonate it and see what happens. Um, and then Hiroshima, of course. And it's this question of now what? And that evidence is pretty clear from the scientists that so many of them that express this concern about what they had created. Um, and it, again, sets up this puzzle that I think can be answered fairly well with that sense of determination and curiosity and uh, prisoner's dilemma of, you know, if we don't do it, they will. So what happens after the war? So, um, you know, as I, I quoted this Einstein uh, from, from 1946, that this is a real governance challenge because, you know, as we, we know from our high school history classes, not even Truman as vice president knew about the bomb project. And yes, you had 250,000 scientists working on different parts of the project, but they didn't, most of them didn't know how it all fit together. They knew that they were trying to uh, work on heavy water, or they were working on plutonium, but they didn't know that what this was all in the service of. So you get then these scientists of, uh, you know, like, like Einstein, and he, he says, we must, you know, this is kind of speaking to the public. The public now, for the first time in 1945, obviously becomes aware of the bomb. And he sets out to, uh, to educate the public and try to create a bottom-up pressure on the leaders who themselves were trying to figure out what to do to engage in some kind of restraint. So he goes out and the, the efforts on this um, are quite, uh, I was going to say noble, um, but noble, not Nobel. So they're noble in the sense that they're trying to go out, they go to churches, they go to, um, you know, high schools, they're trying to create uh, an educated society about what the risks are. What often happens though with the doomers, unfortunately, um, is that they can be a little bit, um, and this is, I think, this is why we have seen this, because you need, you need a dialogue between the scientists and the, and, the, and the political scientists. I don't know a single political scientist who would say that we need a world government. He should have talked to you know, a political science, science contemporary to understand that maybe this wasn't feasible or what the downsides of that approach were. On the other hand, what something um, like that does uh, is create a set of scope conditions for the debate. So it looks in retrospect like this is uh, something that's so uh, sort of quixotic that this could never happen. Um, and yet what this does is get a conversation going. And the argument suggests that without those kinds of sort of equally, the equal and opposite reaction, you know, to the Trinity test is you get this seemingly outlandish proposal for, for world government, uh, that this sets the terms of the debate where without these, these doomers, with, and especially influential ones like Einstein, 
that you might not have ended up with things like the limited test ban treaty in 1963. So, you have this debate then, the, the, the boomers, right? So you have the case of uh, Edward Teller. So he then comes in and says, well, that we need the, the hydrogen bomb. Um, so he kind of tries to push the pendulum back. Um, and I want to kind of move through this a little bit. Then these middle grounders, and this is kind of where things settle. So Hans Bethe, who I, I I like not just because he seems like he was a reasonable middle grounder, but he spent his career at Cornell. So he's a, we have a, one of the dorms is called Hans Beta House. Um, so he then uses his, it's kind of a case of using then your scientific and technical expertise. He conducted a number of different threshold tests for the government to figure out if you have this size bomb, Um, that goes off in the Soviet Union, how, at what threshold will we be able to detect the explosion? And so he uses his expertise to say, I'm not going to weigh on all the politics. I'm going to tell you analytically what this would mean for us in terms of arms control. Uh, and so what this leads to kind of in this pendulum swinging is that uh, instead of you know, we, we have the pictures from 1945. We walk that back. The hydrogen bomb is developed, but the proposals for the neutron bomb or strategic defense initiative, the kind of boomer position falls apart um, to a large extent. We still have missile defense. And I'm not saying that that's good or bad, but what I'm sort of saying, I'm positioning these arguments. We end up with arms control, but no world government. And we end up in this middle ground with partial, the partial test ban treaty passed in 1963. So there is then this case study, too, of social media. So you have this classic boomer technology, um, you know, where Zuckerberg talks about, we're going to just try to quickly prototype and see what's possible. Uh, at the heart, we're just a tech company. We're not trying to do politics at all. And part of the story, or part of my message, I think is really, if, if tech people will read this, is that they need to think ahead. They need to think down the game tree. If I'm successful, if I scale, what might happen? Should I think about these political consequences ex ante? Um, but someone else I was interviewing for this project works in a, a crypto, um, in, the, in the crypto space, and I was one day asking about whether he had, there are people on his, uh, in his startup of 200 people that work on the regulatory or policy side. He said, no, we're trying to get the technology right, because if we don't get the tech right, someone else will beat us to it. And so it doesn't matter what else happens, because we won't even bring it to market. I, and, and I said, but if you don't understand the policy and regulatory environment, you might come with, up with a great technology, but it can't come to market because the regulatory or policy environment doesn't allow it. And so you still see this recurrence of we got to get the tech right, we got to get the tech right. Um, and you certainly see that with the case of social media. So what happens, of course, as we know, is that it grows quickly um, and then leads to these unintended consequences that happen with scale. Um, so the R Russian operatives associated with the Internet Research Agency use social media. They masquerade as Americans. Um, we know kind of that story. That's when uh, Zuckerberg is called in front of Ca Capitol Hill for the first time um, since the inception of the company. We know that uh, Facebook has was unaware or didn't anticipate how the platform could be used uh, for the perpetuation of political violence. Uh, so one of the so so then what are the feedback mechanisms here? Uh, the the one of the things that I'm trying to articulate in the in the book is that again there's a lot there are a lot of feedback mechanisms that are taking place that you might not see if you only looked at well what new laws came from this. So here's a good example is what. what um, one of my um, one of the guys I was interviewing, he said regulation by haranguing. So just getting called in front of Capitol Hill publicly, time after time, that leads to policy changes. Um, so we also see the effect of from Facebook whistleblowers. 
So they come out a little bit like a, a bit a more of aggressive approach than the Project Maven story from Google. But they come out and they sh disclose all kinds of papers. Um, we then see the public and these advertisers that pull their, uh, their money. And that too, is, you might say, well, that's very instrumental. Like, of course, if, you're, if, you, if your users start declining or your advertising money starts declining, you're going to change. But that doesn't change the fact that this led to a string of new policies. Um, so I've been talking to a number of people on the policy team. This policy team didn't exist uh, prior to the election. You now, they now have 200 people studying foreign election interference and trying to anticipate what the next big threat is. So now they've kind of moved from expressly on foreign election interference because of the, the typical military thing of fighting the last war. They think that might not be the next war the role of the oversight board, a slew of new privacy policies, uh, human rights report, transparency reports. One of the things they did was they, re, um, they created Social Science One, which um, is a bit of a longer story, but that's something that Gary King from Harvard, who's a political scientist who does a lot of statistics, worked with the company to make available all kinds of um, of their data public for analysis. So the, the point here of these case studies is to show that these technologies are not static, but they're very responsive to these feedback environments, feedback mechanisms um, that in, kind of in, in some, I think, create a, 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 an optimistic story, not because the Boomers have it right the first time. Um, they have a lot of virtues, but a lot of times they're diving headlong into intellectual pursuits. They're asking uh, not uh, they're asking whether or how something can be done, not whether it should be done. Um, and my story there is that it's that's generally a we want that uh, because without that you can't get innovation. But that these breakthrough technologies that scale end up having unattended consequences that they're often not thinking about in advance. And the policymakers have these huge asymmetries of expertise, so they don't quite know what to do. But that then, those asymmetries lead to this emergence of the doomers in the Wild West that then create feedback me mechanisms that themselves are providing the guardrails and the kind of tech governance that leads to a more stable equilibrium. So I will close there, and I really look forward to hearing uh, your, co your comments and questions. OK, um, great. Uh, Sarah, I'll call on folks that want to ask you questions, but I get the privilege and um, I'm going to abuse it, of uh, asking the first question. So I was wondering how you chose your technologies. Because if you look at the comparisons between nuclear weapons and um, AI or uh, most of the kinds of uh, technologies that have occurred in the last 20 years, uh, in nuclear weapons you had highly centralized government financed capabilities, um, very secretive, uh, in the middle of a hot war, and um, you know, driven by the desire to win that war. And there certainly was no desire to scale. So how uh, do you translate the same model, or is it the same model, when you're coming to technologies today, where you have a tremendous amount of individual innovation, ego-driven innovation in many cases, commercially driven innovation, and uh, the desire to scale that you point to. So how, how, are, how are the two innovative contexts the same or different? And how did you choose the technologies that you're looking at? Thanks. So I, I actually started this by trying to focus on cases where the technology, like I started from much more of an international relations standpoint, which is we have state sovereignty and it, there are these weird cases where the state is essentially letting private actors determine state policy or delegating something for which it loses all control. Um, and so each of those cases, 
fit uh, uh, that context where uh, whether it was in nuclear weapons or, you know, in crypto, for example, you have this scenario where the whole point of crypto is to decentralize away from a centralized Fed. And that's huge. Potentially, that's why Gensler is where he is on this. That's potentially very threatening to a centralized state. And in all of these cases, um, private actors or the case of I'm sure we all follow this when when um, Starlink, when when Elon Musk denied the Ukrainian government access to Starlink. And it was puzzling to me that the, 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 you have an arrangement where you know, the public setting is now basically governed by private actors. Or even in the case of, um, of, of uh, Facebook, you have a public marketplace of ideas that you know the this the, this guy, you know Mark Zuckerberg is deciding what's what should go in it and what shouldn't or the, whether the president should be allowed on the platform or not. So I think I started from that, um, and I sort of have dropped the the IR framework because it felt a little bit clunky. But I think that's still kind of you know looking back at the last hundred years, and I'm curious whether you think I'm missing something or whether you you know. What are the, the big disruptive technologies? And I think that those are some of, like, you know, the AI, for example. We know that AI has been some, around since the 1950s, but um, it's this kind of long arc of technological development. Um, yeah, I wonder whether any are missing. But I think that there are certain patterns that are followed. Like this conversation earlier with Jeff where we were talking about Uber, and he was describing the previous CEO, Travis, and you know, that he wanted to take over the world. Like this idea that we're just gonna get so good and so big and we're gonna take over the world and I'm gonna be in charge. That kind of pattern roughly seems like it applies to these different innovations. But you're talking about competitive innovations, right? Because I would say that one of the most disruptive technologies of the last 100 years or maybe a little more would be antibiotics. Hmm. So you're, you're really sticking, you've chosen them according to security or international security interests. I think interests. that's right. Yeah, yeah. I haven't thought about antibiotics. Well, it doesn't really fit the security field. So but I wonder whether that's, that's <laughs> I'm not trying to rule things out because they don't fit. Um, but I'll, I'll have to think about that one a little bit. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mark. Um, Marsh, thank you very much. Oh, can you hand this back? Thank you. I'm wondering in the context of your case studies, how you would assess or deal with the economic, uh, the, the European Union. The mm. European Union seems like, by hook or by crook, it's ended up being a very powerful, you know, it's a clunky bureaucratic thing, but in terms of antitrust, in terms of privacy, in terms of all sorts of things, they have exerted a huge power. And I don't know, you didn't um, talk about that very much, and I'm wondering if that makes an interesting case also to bring into the analysis. Yeah, no, I've thought about that a lot because especially in um, something like social media, they have taken a, obviously a much more aggressive approach on privacy and fines toward Facebook. And, and in some ways I'll admit that there's a bit of a um, practical decision to so far not talk much about the European Union. Um, but I think I, I've, you know, it's hard to ignore too. You know, just it's so big. It's like it has had such a constraint effect. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, it's, it's almost like your example of the kind of indirect pressure by calling people to testify before Congress. Nobody wants to get the European Union a after them. And, and companies will be extraordinarily um, uh, anticipatory as to what they can get away with and, and so forth. So the EU's influence is not only the directly things they've done, mm -hmm. but I think they have um, a bigger impact um, f from that dimension as well. Yeah, I think that's right. So I think that's important and probably I can't ignore it. Part of me wanted to say yes, but then these platforms just decide to release a different version for Europe because, and that's how they get around it. But. Yeah, and that would be very cool because the ones that they're thinking of introducing are so different than what we yes. have now. So, yeah, but I think that also speaks to this question of you know, this question of what does it mean to be behind an AI regulation? That there's a, a um, 
an aspect of values in these regulatory choices that there is not there's not a deterministic way to think about it and the Europeans are thinking about it very differently and you know I don't want to take a I'm not in this to take a normative position on the other hand I think that um, there are no big tech firms in Europe and I think those are choices that countries make about that doomer boomer kind of tension. And I think a lot of the EU, what they do is they're so, they're so jealous of what the United States has achieved that that's driving a lot of their decision making. Right. Yes. Um, Dan, you're next. Can you speak to the mic? Hello. Hi. <clears throat> well, I think uh, you may have um, gotten into some of this just in your answer there, but first of all, wonderful presentations, so much to chew on. and. I pretty much bought everything you said. <laughs> it resonated with me. I feel like I learned something. I'm just trying to understand the implications because big picture, I was throughout the presentation at first, I thought you were, a lot of it, for a lot of it, I thought you were saying the, the system works. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking, what is a success case? And then I was like, well, the system's working. These are successes because the equilibrium is reached. Mm -hmm. And then towards the end, it felt to me like you were saying, we need to rebalance a little bit the equilibrium and, you know, front load more of the social and political considerations and that will lead. So can you flesh mm -hmm. it out? Like, is there a more successful case that you want us to think about, right? Like, what should we be looking to as the ideal type for success here? And what is it doing downstream? Is it that it leads to less volatility? And there's, it's mm. like, so it's like more of a market model because manias are generally bad, right? In, in economics. So is that the problem? And then there's a crash. But I, yeah, mm. if you can talk me through that a little bit, that'd be great. Yeah, actually, one of the, uh, there's, you probably are familiar with Dan Dresner's book, The System Worked, and he talks about tech governance, oh, sorry, um, financial governance, global governance. And so actually, I talked on the phone with him and I said, I think that's the argument I'm going for, but in tech, like, I think the system kind of works. <laughs> um, he's like, yeah, no one likes that kind of argument. Yeah, I so. was going to say, it's wonderful, but it could have, yeah. Push and back. I think after talking to him, I was, uh, I didn't, you know, I, this is where I come around, but I think that's why I started blaming the boomers a little bit more, that they're not perfect. Um, certainly not perfect, but it's almost like, I, um, yeah, I guess there's that ambivalence. And I, I'm trying not to, again, be normative about like where I think we should end up, but more to observe these patterns. And, 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 and you're right to say um, that I guess I end by saying that these, that was extemporaneous. Maybe that's not in the manuscript. Um, but but, but the, the, the innovators, wouldn't it be great if they thought more about whether they should do something? But, but then there are costs to that. I think that's sort of the argument. Is there cost to restraint at the front end because there might be a lot of um, world changing for the better ideas that just get ignored because well those might lead down roads we don't like it's yeah. that they maybe they shouldn't be thinking about it. maybe they should but but that they're the the what ends what what seems to happen then is that and in part maybe because it's so extreme sometimes that these feedback mechanisms get unleashed along the way to prevent yeah. the kind of Terminator-like outcomes. Well, I'd, I'd be open to more normative guidance, and I, but I think that's a great yeah, answer. Uh, we'll see Justin next. Justin? Thanks so much for this, Sarah. This is a fascinating project, and it's so, it's so great to get a glimpse of you know, the way you think about this and how to get offices all understand it. So, um, so Neil deGrasse Tyson, of all people, has a book called Sci Scientists as Accessories, and I assign it in my class, and I see some of my students here, and they probably read an excerpt from the book. And his argument there is like it doesn't matter whether technologists are actively thinking about what the applications of their technologies might be, because all advances have some sort of direct or indirect application. So like it's inevitable that there's going to be some harmful consequences if you're making any sort of scientific progress. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, like you'd have to stop science altogether to avoid these problems. Okay. So like we're here, we're in an institution of higher learning. And I'm just like wondering, maybe I push a little bit further on Dan's question, right? Can, 
can technologies be thought to, or can technologies be taught to think about this in advance, and should they be, right? Or is the feedback part really necessary, or should we be doing more to, to teach technologists about how to think about this in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes back to this conversation with Vince earlier. I think it really depends on what you're trying to optimize. Like, are you trying to optimize a cutting edge, scientific and technological society and economy? In that case, I think probably Neil is right. Like, that's just kind of how science is going to work. And one of the metaphors I was thinking about um, was uh, that, you know, you're going to have to break a few eggs to make an omelet. You just don't want it being undercooked because you put too many eggs in or overflowing from the skillet. And so it's almost like my doomers are like the skillet trying to kind of keep it contained. Um, but that you, you know, the scientists are just going to crack some eggs. So do you think it's worth being more direct about that in, you know, that, that yeah, I'll have to read the book that, you know, can you really get a thoughtful, advance like scientific advance that doesn't have adverse political or social consequences i don't know I'm oh, okay we got uh, richard and then um in the back here we'll be next yeah. yeah thank you um the 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 prospects of i think getting uh, inventors or scientists to sort of restrain themselves by being thoughtful about the negative consequences is in some sense Wonderful, but hopeless. I think that the utility is so tempting of the mm. prospect of being a big breakthrough and having a big scale, et cetera, et cetera, that even if you get nine people to do it, the tenth wouldn't. So I just don't think there's any serious hope in that. But what, what I'm really interested in is how you get the doomers, who I do think are really important to put constraints and make us go to equilibrium, how they have the right incentives to do what they're doing so they'll actually have an effect that's in the, in the right way. And so, because what I see a lot is the doomers um, are incentivized now to be extremely confident naysayers on television who make it sound like this is going to be a singularity we're all going to disappear into for AI or something of that sort, right? And what is the incentive um, or the utility we can, we can offer for people who are intelligent doomers and actually, you know, anticipate what the prospects might be for the consequences that are somewhat predictable and negative for a technology. Hmm. You know what I mean? So, I mean, we've had a ton of people come out for AI and prognosticate about how this is going to swallow up civilization and this and that. And, and, we, and we have very few who I think have come out and be incentivized to be intelligent and hmm. um, I'll say calibrated in some sense to what the technology really can and can't do. They're not the ones who are popular on television or popular in, you know what I mean? And the same thing happens in lots of other contexts, too. So, um, I mean, we have this debate in philosophy where I'm from, which is that the people who get famous are the people who take completely extreme positions that everybody can remember but are stupid. You know yeah. what I mean? And so how can we incentivize the doomers mm. so that they'll find something really rewarding in not only being accurate and right but having some effect that's worthwhile? That is a good question and one I hadn't, haven't thought about. Um, other than to know that when I push back on journalists, they hate that. All they want to hear is how we're going to all perish because of AI. Right, because journalists have an incentive to sell Because that's the thing. If it bleeds, it leads. Exactly. So I'm going to have to think about that. And I guess my, like in my little, you know, world of policy outreach, what I've started doing is trying, like, like Einstein, uh, trying to educate the media with, and if they don't quote me on this, that's, well, so be it, that's their choice. But to ask the question of, well, what are the harms we're trying to contain here? Let's think of before we lurch for an answer, let's figure out what the problem is. So I do think that's a role of academics is to, be articulating kind of a sensible approach, uh, even if the media doesn't like it, to try to be analytical about it and raise that question, these kinds of questions. Provide evidence. And provide evidence, right? Yeah. 
So you're. Can you stand up, I will. Um, you you seem to be looking for a bit of a an ex ante framework for thinking about these harms and these risks. I wonder if you've thought about sort of institutional review boards and what they do when reviewing research and the potential harms. Could I replace your title, Boomers, Doomers, and the Politics of Innovation, with a framework about Boomers, Doomers, and the Politics of Human Subjects Research, for example? Uh, yes. Can you say a little bit more? Uh, th replace Zuckerberg with Milgram. Uh -huh. We learned a whole lot of, uh, uh, from social science research about obedience to authority, tolerance to extreme cold, and whatnot. Uh, so but now we, have, the... now we have a framework in place, the Belmont Report Institutional Review Boards, to say, wait a minute, before we go down this path, let's make sure that mm. we're preventing some of the harms that we already know about and continue to update based upon uh, what we learned about the human condition. So is the implication that the IRB, I don't think that's what you're saying, but that the IRB is stifling potential innovations or that that's the process, a mechanism that now can try to ensure and guard against excessive uh, both are probably true, but if you're looking for a framework where we're not just scrambling to a new equilibrium after we mm. realize the harms of technology, perhaps a, a, an ex-ante approach um, yeah. could provide yeah. a way to avoid some of those harms. Yeah, I, it's interesting because I've thought a lot about it as I've, re I've been reading these, these experiments that were done, you know, testing how the body responds to injections of plutonium and at what point you start to have organ failure. And I think that's why we have the IRB today is because that was a really dumb thing to have done. I, you know, one of the challenges that um, I think, uh, and again, all of these are decisions that have trade-offs is, um, and I was talking to someone about this today, just the sort of a university research context versus industry. I don't think industry is constrained the way academic researchers are, and that's in part too why we um, why we have credibility in a way, which is that we have we don't have the profit motive. We don't we, people know that we have an IRB that we have to go through, um, and that that does allow us a kind of a, a legitimate platform for talking to the media or talking to members of Congress about some of these policies. Um, but I see that, I, I like that idea, I like that, that analogy of the IRB, I'll have to think about that more too. Okay, and just one more question. Thank, all right, the two of you there, you take the, just, you have to ask the questions one, one together and they have to be great. <laughs> <laughs> Very oh, short, and it has to be a question. Yeah, I think my, uh, my question kind of relates to, again, since we're talking specifically about tech um, and just how, you know, the implications and such. So, I mean, just being familiar with, like, open source projects, I was wondering if in your observations have you seen maybe, because I feel like with open source projects, that feedback men you, that you mentioned where people kind of chime in or even actually are actively developing the technology itself, uh, I was wondering if, if you were to see any observation uh, and if that had an impact. Like maybe open source versus closed source, as we've seen with social media. Okay, and then the other. Uh, so for this one, uh, in, in past technologies like the atomic bomb, you had to have a whole bunch of equipment to make all this stuff. But now we're talking a lot more about software. Mm -hmm. um, do we even should we even be considering like regulation? Is that even possible at this point? Or now that the internet exists and we can share all this stuff, and you mentioned open source um, projects. Um, is it just not viable to regulate stuff anymore? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think the first question is a really good one. I mean, it makes me think about um, open AI, which is not open anymore, um, versus hugging phase, and which is open. And that the, again, one of the things that, one of, part of one of these dynamics is that, especially I would say once um, all the, Microsoft and VC money started flowing into OpenAI, there is this kind of um, urgency to produce and make progress. Um, and I think what that suggests is that open source would address some concerns, but financially it doesn't, it's not as viable, it doesn't appear to be as viable. And that those dynamics in industry are pretty powerful. 
Um, so I wonder whether that, again, it addresses some things, but it comes at the cost of, of others. Um, and then on regulation, I, do, you know, I think it really depends on what it is. So, you know, I, in thinking about generative AI, um, I also had thought that, um, well, it's how do you regulate lines of code? Um, and what's different, I think, about the, these, um, you know, the big, the, the giants, um, uh, OpenAI, for example, is that the amount of compute power, I mean, this is why OpenAI is trying to buy up all the NVIDIA GPUs. It's like, it's an arms race and they need to just like hoard the GPUs. Um, and so it's more than just lines of code. There is this compute power, which is why the US government has these export controls trying to prevent the Chinese government from getting the same compute power so that they don't benefit from. And so that it, it's a bit more than just the lines of code. It's kind of the, the, the orders of magnitude. And I think that's where at least the government thinks that they can regulate aspects of this. Would you mind if I added just a quick follow-up on that? Okay. So, Only quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, let's, let's throw out, just, just take for, for the hypothetical that we, we solve that compute power problem, um, quantum computing, something like mm -hmm. that, something in that realm, and that's no longer an issue. Mm. Um, and like any guy on a, on a laptop can start doing this stuff mm -hmm. then, yeah, no, I okay. think it's a losing, I do think time is not on the side. Okay. But you know, when I talk to policymakers, they say, we don't care in 10 years, we're worried about this shorter term window. Got it, thank you. All right, thank you for a very stimulating presentation. Thanks. 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 Thanks.